Let's pray together. What an immense privilege it is to be here together tonight, O oh Lord, to look into your word, to think that on the other side of the wall over there, young ones are hearing your word, learning to open your word, learning to find books and chapters and verses, learning to cultivate a discipline of sitting under your word and listening for their hearts. God, we thank you that there are students in student ministries being taught to worship, being taught to discern, being fed from your word. God, we pray that you would grow from those gardens much fruit, that you would raise up an army of people who will be proclaimers of your gospel, believers of your word, those who stand on conviction with truth in a wavering, lost world. God, would you arm them even now? Even for those who do not yet know you, may they store up treasures from your word in their hearts that one day when you open their eyes spiritually, they will be able to reach back into those treasures stored. We thank you for the servants who labor on their behalf. God, give them wisdom and clarity with your word and insight into those little lives, those young lives, those growing lives. God, I pray as we open your word tonight together uh, that you would speak, that your word would be clear, that you would bring conviction to our own lives and hearts about how to live in this world. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Wow, it's so good to be together. Uh, my heart is just full of a full day of uh, worship with God's people, being under his word. And uh, just to think about the kids over there, it's just heartwarming. Uh, love the servants that labor on their behalf. Uh, we love that they get to hear the word and they want to be together. It's good for us to be together too. And uh, I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel. If you don't have a Bible, we've got a few up here uh, on, the, on the shelf and uh, maybe David Britton, if you'd be willing to hand out Bibles, just put your hand up if you don't have one. We'd love for you to be able to follow along tonight. Um, looks like maybe Carlos left his Bible at home. <laughs> you, you singled yourself out, Carlos. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right, Daniel chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 3 to 7 tonight. Have you ever been discouraged by someone who is in charge over you who made a bad decision. And that decision affects your life. Have you ever been under authority when that authority sins and the consequences of that sin spill into your life? Maybe you have a boss at work who asks for more bricks and no straw. Maybe there's a new coaching staff on your sports team. Maybe a new administration in government, new management at a business that you frequent. Maybe the menu has changed and you just can't eat there anymore. Maybe there are new rules and regulations for some aspect of your life that just complicate your recreation. Maybe they make it difficult to live in your own home. Maybe some bureaucrat has meddled with your otherwise comfortable life. And maybe it's not that something has changed for you. Things have always just been hard, unjust, nonsensical, frustrating, and maybe there's little hope for change in the future. Those in power make decisions that affect everyone under their management. And often those in power are exempt from the consequences of their decisions. Often those in power use their position for self-gain at the expense of everyone else. We might coin a term and call this homardiocracy. Homardios is the Greek word for sin. <laughs> What's it like to be governed by sinners? We might call it a depravatocracy. <laughs> that is life under the governance of finite people who make bad decisions and sinful people who make sinful decisions, and we all bear the consequences. And listen, every form of government in human history has suffered from it. 
Every participant in human history has suffered under it. Tyrants and mid-level bureaucrats, majority rule, mob rule, all of it together has conspired to put the hoi polloi under the whims of the power brokers of this world. Jehoiakim was a bad king. He did bad things. He led the nation into rebellion against God. His sinful decisions were part of the recipe for Israel's exile. Nebuchadnezzar was a bad king. He was a tyrant, a murderer, a pagan idolater. If you didn't like what he did, he would slow roast you in an oven. He was a pagan idolater and made sinful decisions and spread his idolatry to farther reaches. And then you've got Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. They did not conspire with Jehoiakim and the bad kings of Israel and the bad kings of Judah in a conspiracy of idolatry, spiritual harlotry against the God who had called out his people as his own special possession. They had not participated in the religious hypocrisy of the religious leadership. They were not the idolaters. In terms of what happens in the exile, they were the innocent party. Four youths from Israel who were innocent of Jehoiakim's idolatry and Israel's spiritual apostasy. They were innocent of Nebuchadnezzar's crimes against God and humanity, and they were nevertheless taken from their homes and whisked away to Babylon. Well, listen, there is no end to the hoi polloi being trampled by tyrants, subject to the whims of the power brokers of the earth, run over by oligarchies, anarchies, and every form of government in between. No end to that until Messiah's kingdom comes to the earth and smashes the ten toes. We will always live under that. We will go from one administration to another, one form of government from another, one experiment in human governance to another until Messiah reigns. There's nothing new under the sun. Until the day the Son Himself comes, we will always be subject to the pulsing tides and tumults of power and oppression and corruption at the hands of sinful men. We will suffer the consequences of other people's bad decisions and sinful choices. And others will suffer the consequences of our bad decisions and sinful choices. So where is our hope? The next administration? A better job? Fugitive to a new land, colonize the moon. <laughs> Some change in our situation. Only Yahweh. Only Yahweh can be our hope. Hezekiah faltered. He thought, maybe the Babylonians can keep me safe from the Assyrian threat. Jehoiakim faltered, utterly failed. Maybe the Egyptians can keep me safe from the Babylonian threat. Jeremiah's message, trust the Lord. And specifically, he's bringing the exile, go to Babylon, trust his plan. His plans are good to prosper and not to harm. The exile would be Yahweh's doing. Daniel and his friends were innocent parties to sinful tyrants, apostate kings, and that brings us to Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 to 7, and we see the Babylonization of Israel's best, the Babylonification, the, the Babylonizing of Israel's best. Let's read the text together, beginning in verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths in whom was no defect who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered him to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they should be grown three years, at the end of which they were to enter into the king's personal service." Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them. To Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah 
Abednego. We see in this passage the Babylonization of Israel's best. Some of the flower of Israel's youth, the best and the brightest, were brought far away to the capital of the enemy empire, into the seat of idolatry. And we're to see what happens to them this evening. First, we'll notice their selection in verses 3 and 4. The king, that is King Nebuchadnezzar, ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths with no defect, good-looking, intelligent in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, who had ability for serving in the king's court. Nebuchadnezzar goes and picks some from the sons of Israel. He doesn't mean kids from the northern tribes. He simply means descendants of Israel, descendants of Jacob or Israelites. And we find out particularly they were from Judah. Nebuchadnezzar didn't only pick Israelites. On this same trip, Josephus records that he picked up some Phoenicians, some Syrians, and Egyptians as well, dragged them all off to Babylon to make them useful in his court. He says here specifically that they are from the seed of the kingship, literally, in verse 3. Some of the royal family. And saying some from the royal family misses this key word, the seed of the kingship. That is a tip-off to the storyline of the Bible where God has promised a seed of the woman to come through Abram, to come through Judah, to come through David, to come through Hezekiah's line, to whom was promised they'll take some of your own seed and haul him off to Babylon, make him serve in their courts. That's what's happening here. Now, we must understand that even in this exile, God is preserving the royal seed line for the future coming of Messiah. God is faithful to His promises even in this. Nebuchadnezzar is not interested in preserving the Messiah's seed line. He just wants royalty to serve in his royal court. The kids brought up as nobles would understand some of the propriety of being in high places. It says they came from royal family and from nobles. The, kings want, the king wants royals for service in his court. These are assets, not POWs. Although it is possible that uh, one reason to have royal line in your royal court is a quasi-hostage. I mean, maybe Jehoiakim can be kept in line if he knows that some of the best of Israel's royal line are held captive in Babylon. I mean, you're not going to nuke Babylon if some of your kids are there. Of course, that's a technological anachronism. They're called here young men, and it doesn't give a specific age, but I think there are some contextual reasons to believe that the youth here are not older than about 15 Sixty-seven years after this, Daniel is still serving in government offices under the Persian Empire. It's hard to imagine him being much older than a middle teenager. And regimes in this era, regimes outside of Babylon, other than Nebuchadnezzar, were known to conscript young men for similar purposes. And the documentation tells us that they were conscripted for three years of royal service and education and enculturation. And the age of that service was from 14 to 17. This is what the Persians did just up the road. So it's reasonable to suspect that Daniel is as young as 15 or around there. And they picked this age and this season for training because they wanted youths who were old enough to understand, old enough to go along with the significant cultural change, and yet young enough to be flexible, teachable, malleable, and to sort of go with the flow old enough to understand, old enough emotionally to make the geographical adjustment, and yet able to learn. The text tells us that they were to be attractive. Look at verse 4. Youths in whom was no defect. They were good-looking. That is, they were to be physically attractive. In one sense, these are trophies for the king's court. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to surround himself with the beautiful people. He needed to impress people in his court with the best of the best, and that included being physically attractive. Next, they were to be intelligent, verse 4, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom. Uh, that is, uh, having an aptitude for learning. It's not that they had to already know everything. 
but they had to demonstrate an ability to have decision-making and analytical skills. Next, Daniel records that they were endowed with understanding. Literally, they were knowing knowledge. And then finally, they were discerning knowledge in the English text. That is, they had an understanding of knowledge. That is, they had to know things, and they had to know how to know things. A scientific mind, an ability to take in information and, and remember it and then apply it to specific situations. These are the things that Nebuchadnezzar was looking for. And then finally, they had to have the right personality. There in verse 4, they had the ability for serving in the king's court. And that is, they had to be fit for palace life. The word for palace here is the same word used for temple. And, and given the idolatry and the, the reality of the king's role in the idolatrous worship of the nation, uh, maybe temple is the idea here. There was certainly a close relationship between the royal life and the religious life. Nebuchadnezzar wanted young men who would have court presence and discretion and poise. They could handle themselves appropriately in social context that royal service demanded. After the selection, we have the relocation of the youths. Look at verse 3. The king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel. Brought them in. And if the parallel to the temple vessels we looked at last week holds, they, they were brought right into Babylon, right into the capital, capital right into the precinct. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar's temple, or Nebuchadnezzar's palace, was right next to the temple complex for the worship of Marduk. All of this stuff was right there in the center of Babylon. This was 500 miles in a straight line away from Judah. Some have estimated that it was about a thousand mile journey because they couldn't walk in a straight line. They would be caravaned there together. Could you imagine what it would be like to be relocated in this way? It's not just a job offer in a faraway place. It's not a travel brochure. Nebuchadnezzar's army has approached Jerusalem and begun to lay siege to the city. Uh, you and I who have lived here in America have really never had enemy invading boots on our ground. We haven't had an enemy standing army on our land. Could you imagine the turmoil that that would create in the entire population? And then to have the city that you lived in surrounded by an army you could not withstand. This would bring about a tremendous angst. Later on, when Nebuchadnezzar would put the, squeeze the stranglehold on Jerusalem in the final siege, we read the, read the report about it from Jeremiah and Lamentations. The people were being starved to the point that women were giving birth and eating their children. It was awful. And the anticipation leading up to that final siege would bring all the angst, all the worry, apparently for the people of Israel, not faith and repentance, <laughs> just worry, scrambling for some political solution. It would be hard to imagine the, the anxiety built up in that. There's no battle described in any of the sieges. I think that implies that these four youths, among the others from Judah that were taken in 605 B.C., were just given up. Did Jehoiakim work out some negotiation to say, well, uh, don't take us over, I'll be your puppet, we'll give you all our gold, and take these guys? Can you imagine? Your own king? His job is to defend the city, his job is to lead the people to godliness, his job is to put himself between you and an opposing army, and he hands you over. What would it be like to be Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah? We come to their education in verse 4, the last part of the verse. Nebuchadnezzar ordered Ashpenaz that they should be educated, that he would teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. 
At this point, Babylon was the center of literature and science and learning in the ancient world. Aramaic had become the lingua franca, so they would be speaking Aramaic. It's obvious that Daniel had that ability because nearly half of the book is written in Aramaic. But the literature of the Chaldeans was in Akkadian and Sumerian. Sumerian was actually the technical language of the sciences of Babylon and the scholarly language of the literature. It was complicated. It was not alphabetized. It was based on syllables given individual symbols, uh, specifically cuneiform impressions in clay tablets. Could you imagine writing a personal letter? I've got these little blocks of wood, and I need that syllable in a clay tablet. Now, my kids have seen some of these things in school. I walk through the halls at, a, at their prep school, and there's cuneiform artifacts and pictures on the wall. They would have had to learn these things. It was complicated. Alphabets are easy, by the way, comparatively. We have found lots of the literature of the ancient Babylonians. Uh, much of this has come to light through archaeological excavations, much that would have been extant in Nebuchadnezzar's day, but literature that goes all the way back to the days of Abraham. Remember, Abraham was from Ur of the Chaldees. That is the southern part of Babylonia near the Persian Gulf. It is where the Chaldean word gets its origin. It was the southern Chaldeans that kind of took over Babylonia and then became synonymous with Babylon. We use Chaldean Babylon synonymously, but there is a time in Babylonian history where the Chaldeans were the specialists within the Babylonian empire who had their own language and knew all the math and had all the science and did all the fortune telling. Those were the Chaldeans. Daniel and his four friends would have been taught in these things. And many of the literature is still available to us today, and, and some of it's on my shelf. Some of uh, the kids read them in the, the course of civilization and history. The laws of Hammurabi, the Gilgamesh epic, that's the ancient flood narrative. Enuma Elish, the creation story, and the Babylonian chronicle, the history of Babylonian kings, all of those would have been available. And then you had things like the omen texts. These were entire series of writings devoted to divining the future by signs. Something is an omen. Somebody gives birth in a weird way. Ooh, what does that mean? And there were whole books devoted to telling you, what does that mean? In fact, one omen text is set, that we found is 77 straight tablets of observing the sun, the stars, and the moon. And when you see these configurations, this is what it portends. This is what's coming. There were medical omens, one collection of 40 tablets that gave instructions and predictions from signs like reading the shapes of animal livers. There were omens in nature that could tell you what would happen based on the flight patterns of birds as they flew by. There were uh, entire uh, sections of literature given to dream interpretations. One collection is 110 straight tablets that is a documented statement about what dreams mean. And that'll come up later in the book of Daniel. Now, interestingly, they don't tell you what dreams are. <laughs> Those tablets don't tell you what somebody had as a dream. They just tell you when somebody tells you they had this dream, you tell them what it means. This wasn't an off-the-cuff kind of thing for uh, Babylonian wise men to say to Nebuchadnezzar. That's why he, they get into that whole tussle with, no, you tell us your dream and then we'll tell you what it is, meaning we can go back to the library and look it up. This was part of the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. And there was also literature devoted to mathematics, philosophy, religion, literature, astronomy, and astrology. And why was all of this here? This was for the king's service. He wanted to bring them into a capability to serve in his royal court. Uh, this is not punishment. From Nebuchadnezzar's standpoint, from Ashpenaz's standpoint, uh, they're not mistreating these Jewish youths. In fact, they are treating them to a world-class education. They think they've invited them to the Ivy League schools of the world and given them a full-ride scholarship and room and board. 
This is a positive thing for the Babylonians. By the way, Ashpenaz is likely a Persian name, an indication that the Jews are not the only people that have been educated in Babylonian ways and brought into the king's service. It seems that Nebuchadnezzar's chief of staff is in that category. And so Nebuchadnezzar wanted to surround himself with the best. Interestingly, not yes men, not people who didn't know anything where Nebuchadnezzar was just going to be the smartest man in the room by miles and leave everybody in the dust and everybody just do what they said out of fear. But he actually brought people in, people from other cultures and other subdued nations and had them educated. He wanted learned people around him. That's a mark of some at least earthly wisdom on Nebuchadnezzar's part. Why would he do this? Why would he want well-trained, well-educated administrators around him? Well, he was building a big empire. It takes a lot of work to control all the bureaucracy. Perhaps he wanted diplomats. What would, it be, what would it be like to have Jewish faces on Babylonian thought patterns, Babylonian language abilities, and Babylonian knowledge? Perhaps even Babylonian loyalties. Well, that might be really helpful in keeping the land of Palestine in line. It would be helpful in his proxy rule over the land of Israel. It would be helpful in his rule over the Jewish exiles in Babylon. And so here were the four, being educated in the literature and the ways of Babylon. Next, in verse 5, we get their cultivation and by cultivation, I just mean growth, but not growth merely in physical stature, but growth in all ways. And this comes from the word in the New American Standard in verse 5, right in the middle of the verse, that says educated. Uh, he appointed that they should be educated three years. I think that's an unfortunate translation. It is simply the very basic Hebrew word that means to make great. They were to be made great. They were to be grown. They were to be cultivated. Notice what verse 5 says, the king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be made great three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Again, the goal is the king's service. Nebuchadnezzar wants to make them great, and he's going to do that over a span of three years. Isaiah 1, 2 uses the same word to make great just to mean growth in physical stature. I think that's what's in view here, the physical and intellectual growth to make them fit for service to the king. He wanted to grow them. And so he gave them the best food. Notice what he says. The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food, from the delicacies, the dainties of the king's banquet table. And if you want a nice Persian word, it's the pat bag. I want to start using that around the table. What do we have tonight? Is it the pat bag? The best of the best. Really good food. From Nebuchadnezzar's view, it's how am I going to get these guys to love being here, to, to grow strong, to grow in their physical stature, maintain uh, their healthy complexion, and be excited about studying. Give them good food. Let them have enjoyment, privilege, luxury, the best of the best, the king's table, choice food. This was all thought to help them excel in their studies. Now, the problem with the king's food, and we'll get into this more a little bit next week, is twofold. In all likelihood, the king's food was not kosher. It was not the diet set apart for God's people, Israel. It would have violated Mosaic laws, Mosaic, Mosaic dietary restrictions. Now, they certainly couldn't be guaranteed that it would be prepared in the right ways and that all the right meats would be served. And secondly, the problem with this food is it would have been offered to idols. The king's table in ancient Babylon was first and foremost devoted to the gods. It was presented to the deities, multiple deities, and often the patron deity of whatever king was in charge. In Nebuchadnezzar's term, it was Marduk, sometimes called Bel. And that food was presented to him, and all the food belonged to the god. And you had to give the god the best of the best that you had. And when the god was done with his portion. 
then the king got it second. And you know what was funny? There was never any food missing. <laughs> the king got it all. And then it was this immense privilege for anybody the king favored to have from the king's table. And it was the best. This would be problematic for our four youth. We find out later in the book of Daniel that Daniel ate meat and drank wine. The point here is not some paleo diet, but paleo for us, 7th century BC. For Daniel, it would have been contemporary diet, fad diet. <laughs> Vegetables only, it's the cool thing to do. I can actually get stronger by eating only vegetables. That's not the point of the next section. It was miraculous. In spite of Babylonian culturation, God gave them favor, God sustained them, God gave Daniel interpretation of dreams. The whole point is the sovereignty of God and keeping God's people there. It's not some clever way to find some new food fat. And we'll find out what they did with the food next week. But the real question is compromise related to food not prepared, food not coming from the Mosaic prescription, and food specifically prepared for idols. And, and why was this important? Again, this was not punishment. The, the, these youths were to be given the best food. They were to be cultivated, grown for the king's service. The, belie the king believes he's giving them the best for their own good and ultimately for his own good. And he wants to inculcate them in the Babylonian worldview. I think there's something for the king in this in purchasing their loyalties. I don't know what their lives were like back in Judah. I don't know what their personal allowance was. I don't know what their clothing allowance was. I don't know how many ribeye steaks they got to have or how many pulled pork sandwiches. Zero. But now the table is full in front of them. They've got access and privilege. They've got the best of the best. They've got stature. They would be seen by all of Babylon as the special privileged youths. And they're from out of town. They were given a world-class education. They were given the good life, the great life. This was to shape them into being the best that Babylonian privilege could produce. And this would purchase for Nebuchadnezzar loyal servants. That's the intent. The byproduct of that is the Babylonification of these Judean youths. Let's look at their reorientation verses 6 and 7. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The commander of the officials assigned new names to them. Belteshazzar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Notice the little phrase, among them. Verse 6. Now among them from the sons of Judah, I think the idea there is that there were other sons of Judah who came. We get four names, we get four characters in this narrative, we get four young men who stand out. We're not given any other names. Does that mean that nobody else stood out? Does that mean that nobody else would refuse the king's food? Nobody else would refuse to bow down and worship a statue? Nobody... What happened to the rest? We don't hear about them. We do get a report from Jeremiah that the, the spiritual state of the Jews who went into Babylonian captivity was awful, abysmal. I think these are the four faithful. And they get new names. Daniel's name means God is my judge. What a fantastic name that is. Congratulations to those of you in this room who share that name. God is my judge. You know what that means? You honor the Lord, you have nothing else to fear. Who would bring a, car, a charge against God's elect? God's the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? What a liberating name. King, I don't care what you do to me. God is my judge. To the degree that Daniel lived up to his name and believed the truth in his name, oh, what a glorious name. Does that say something about Daniel's parents? Did they mean it when they named him? I hope so. 
Hananiah, Yahweh is gracious. Yahweh is gracious. The self-existent covenant-keeping God of Israel, the one who's entered into relationship with his people and set them apart for his own purposes, for his own glory, who set his affections on this people and not the other people's, he is gracious. Wow, what a great name. Mishael. Who is what God is? Sounds kind of funny in English. Who is what God is? Nobody is what God is. He's peerless. There's nobody con to compare him to. Uh, just understand the fundamental creator-creature distinction. He is transcendent of all of the universe. There is nothing you can compare to him. There's no size you can compare to him. There's nothing in the created order that you should even make a likeness to a comparison. I mean, it, he has no peers. He has no rivals. Who is what God is? What a great name to name your kids when the country around you is going apostate and worshiping every god of the nations, the Asherahs, the Baals, the Molechs, the Mardukes. Under every green tree and on every high hill, from Dan to Beersheba, from sea to shining sea, we would say, idolatry. And this kid's name, who is what God is? That's either just sort of ignorant of parents, like, oh, this sounds cool. Let's look in the name book. What are the 24 most popular names? Let's go retro. Or were they thinking about what it meant? I hope they were thinking about what it meant. Looking at the apostasy of the nation, we're going to name you who is what God is. And Mishael, and then Azariah, Yahweh helps. Yahweh helps. You see the downgrade of the nation, and who is our hope? The next king of Judah? Nope, 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 and nope, exile. <laughs> and then what? Times of the Gentiles, and we're not done with that yet. Who is our hope? Who helps? Yahweh helps. There is hope in these names. There is faith in these names. There is confidence in the God of Israel in these names. These names reflect a worldview, culture, hopefully a godly parentage. The God of Israel is gracious. He helps those who are His. There is no God like Him, and He is judge. Those four guys walking around Babylon. Babylon. And then they get renamed. <laughs> Common practice. You see this throughout the ancient Near East. You see it in biblical history. Joseph, when he went to Egypt, got renamed. I don't know, you know, we call Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. We, we remember them. But who calls Joseph Zaphnath Paneah? <laughs> don't name your kids that. I didn't look up what it means. Hadassah was renamed, anybody know? In Esther 2.7? Esther. Esther. Gordon Sumner, renamed Sting. You guys know the, the lead singer for the police? He wore a black and yellow sweater to school one day in elementary school. His mom made him the sweater. Every kid thought he looked like a bumblebee. They called him Sting, and it stuck, so now he's Sting. That's not in the text. That's just... <laughs> people rename people. And people give names because either they want to have control or uh, they want to be cute or whatever. This was a worldview shift. This was an undermining of a biblical worldview and the enculturation of a Babylonian worldview. Daniel gets renamed Belteshazzar, which is something like, Bel, protect the king. Wait, God is my judge. Okay, Pagan deity, protect the idolater. That's my new name. Hananiah gets Shadrach. Mishael gets Meshach. Hananiah was Yahweh is gracious. I'm not confident enough to tell you what Shadrach means. It's the command of Ak, most likely. 
And some have tried to say that Ak is short for Aku, the Sumerian moon god. I tried and tried and tried. I read everything I have on ancient Sumerian, Babylonian, and Akkadian religious systems, and I could not find the god Aku. I even went to Wikipedia. <laughs> so whether or not that's true, I don't know. I don't know. It could be true. I hope you know the principle of archaeology. Absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Do you understand that principle? Um, when, when we study ancient civilizations, the, you could draw a circle, a, a circle around all the things that existed. Every document, every potsherd, every building, every bone fragment. Draw a circle around everything that existed in, say, Babylon in 605 B.C. Now, draw a smaller circle around everything that existed then that still exists now. How big is that circle? According to biblical archaeologists, if the first circle is this big, that next circle of what still exists is about that big. Now, expand that circle of what still exists and make a smaller circle of that of what has been dug up. Then expand that circle and make the same size, smaller circle of what has been rightly identified then expand that, make a smaller circle of what has been accurately cataloged, then expand that and make a smaller circle of what has been read and remembered and actually cited in popular resources, not buried in some library again. And you understand that just because modern day archeologists haven't found something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. In fact, the best attestation of ancient civilization, ancient history, is the Bible. There's no better reference text for what happened from the beginning of the world until now, or at least until the life and times of Christ in the first century. And so, just because we haven't found some God named Aku doesn't mean that's not the right answer. I just don't know enough to say, this is what Meshach means. But instead of Hananiah being God is gracious, he is the command of something, and it's not good. And then Mishael, who is what God is, he gets called who is like Ak, whatever Ak is. <laughs> and then Azariah, Yahweh helps Abednego, the slave of Nebo. That's the Babylonian god that Nebuchadnezzar was named after. What an insult. This isn't just giving Gordon Sumner the nickname Sting so he can get famous and have a, have a band. <laughs> This is worldview enculturation. It's intentional. It undermines their identities. It undermines their memories. It undermines the very fabric of who they were and what their parents called them and why. It undermines hope and the promises of God. It also normalizes polytheism. It normalizes polytheism. Right? I... I do appreciate the line from the Avengers when Captain America says something about a fictitious Norse god and he said, there's only one god, ma'am, and I'm sure he doesn't dress like that. But the fact that we even have a, a, a conversation about Thor and wh whoever the other guys are, Loki and all the rest, the, the fact that there's, there's even the, the, the demigods and the, and the gods of the pantheon of Greco-Roman religious systems, the fact that there are even Akkadian gods and Sumerian gods and Babylonian gods and that their names would cross our lips is the normalization of idolatry and, and polytheism. It's reprehensible. It would be great if we didn't even have those in our vocabulary and Daniel and his friends' names get rewritten. And do you feel the oppressive effects of that on your theology, where we just get comfortable saying, Bell and Marduk and Bell protect the king. Hey, Bell protect, me, protect the king, will you get me a glass of orange juice? It just becomes so normal. And this is part of the deception of a worldview battle with biblical truth. And these four young men were facing it. We're facing in our day with the normalization of language of compromise, where we get comfortable with things that are contrary to biblical categories. We get comfortable with things God hates. Fornication is called sleeping around. We're, we're not doing any sleeping. We've euphemized it. We've normalized it. Adultery is an affair. The murder of the unborn is abortion. Abortion just 
means to stop something, but we've, we, we, we've made clinical and, and procedural murder of the most innocent among us. Even worse than abortion, it's called a choice. Or even worse, health care. Homosexuality is a lifestyle. We get comfortable with language that confuses gender. And we normalize and we mainstream aberrant ideas. And there are so many other examples. In fact, there are so many examples that I am pretty sure I am unaware of how I myself normalize things God hates. The way a fish doesn't know to feel wet. This is intentional in Babylon. What do we learn from this text? We, we find out that four Hebrew youths were hauled off, educated, enculturated, re-identified. I want us to think about a few things reflecting on this this evening. First, let's just think about how difficulty and how temptation brings character to the surface. Difficulty and temptation do not produce sin. Do you understand that in your life? They reveal it. They scrape off comfortable things. Maybe they scrape away societal protections. Maybe they scrape away the good peer pressure of being around Christians. And they leave us exposed to discomfort, temptation, and difficulty. And what do we see when those innards are laid bare? How you handle difficulty speaks to your character. So think about these four youths and what it means for their trial. Homardiocracy at work, depravitocracy, life under sinners, tyrants making bad choices, people in charge making sinful decisions, and four youths bear the consequences. That is a trial. That's a difficulty. Stolen from home, that's hard. Probably never to return. You know another trial for these four youths? The lap of luxury. Immense privilege. Three square meals, not square meals, three over the top, pat bag meals. The best, the best clothing, world-class education, free ride, all the rest. Could you imagine the temptation to compromise overtly? Could you imagine the tendency to forget subtly, incrementally, to get comfortable in the lap of luxury? Listen, Nebuchadnezzar wanted to obligate them and that obligation would bring compromise. How do you go there, sit in those classrooms, sit at those tables, and stay resolute? That is a trial. Luxury, success, everything on a golden spoon is a trial that I'm convinced hardly anybody is prepared for. These four were prepared, prepared you don't learn the things you need to learn for that moment in that moment. Platform, fame, influence, power, access, celebrity. I'm convinced the worst thing for the human heart is to get fame, followers, celebrity, fortune, everything you think you want, everything we envy in the people in the magazines. Yeah, that's what I want. Uh, just get it. Watch what happens to you. Read the reports and the statistics of everyone who has won the lottery. <laughs> it's not good for the human heart. How will these four do? Think about the difficulty of relocation, indoctrination, and culturation. Are you prepared on a Sunday evening to walk into your week to relocate from here, 
to relocate from this fellowship, from this room, from being under the word of God together. There's something to that. We all hear the same things. We look at each other, we say, yes, and then it's Monday morning. Are you prepared to relocate? Are you prepared for indoctrination? What will you walk into this week? What will those students on the other side of the wall walk into this week? Are you preparing them for indoctrination? Enculturation. Who are your friends, digital and otherwise? We, some of us have real friends still. But all the influences in life. We tend to be like the people we want to be like. We tend to gravitate towards the people around and the way they talk, the way they think, the things they love. Have you prepared yourself for the enculturation of the surroundings you will walk into this week? And have we prepared those kids? To walk into Babylon was to walk into the, the pantheon, a, a tryout of gods at the top, dozens of second-level deities, and countless village protector demons that you paid tribute to everywhere you went. And everywhere our kids go when they leave our home, all those idols. Are you firm in your knowledge and your convictions? Can your truth withstand the onslaught of 70 years of an ungodly worldview? Wow. 14 years old, Daniel. Going to walk across the desert. And for the next 70 years, the things you got in your first 14 need to sustain you. Can you imagine what it would be like to be ridiculed, singled out, browbeaten intellectually for your Neanderthal views. Our kids face that. A prep school, college prep school, a public school, a private school, private Christian school. Are they prepared to face untruth from teachers that they love and from peers that they admire and they want the peers to admire them and they live under the fear of man and the tyranny of what's cool at the moment? Are they fortified for the homeschool co-op or the homeschool curriculum? Whatever brand of education our kids are under, are they fortified with discernment and a knowledge of the truth and a loyalty to Yahweh? And we shudder when we think about college. <laughs> At college, the idol is open-mindedness, which means believe nothing. The only thing you can believe is that everyone must believe nothing because if somebody believes something, that's a threat to us who want to believe nothing. <laughs> and the religion department at ASU, you think, oh yeah, state school, free education. Oh yeah, and my kid can study the Bible while they're in college. Do you know what they're going to learn in the religion department at ASU? Go ask Tyler Azeltine. <laughs> where the professor's stated intention in class is to strip you of your Sunday school naivety, to open the Bible and teach you the Bible as a flawed book written by men that should not be listened to. You know what the religion department at Baylor University is? Texas. Christian land, Baptist school, Baptist flagship college with a football team, and cheerleaders, their Bible department is the same as ASU. The head of their Bible department preaches, if you care to know, Wellhausen, which the scholarly biblical world has rejected, and he still holds on to it with a tenacious grip. He's telling students, Baptist students who come in and, yeah, I'm going to a good Baptist school, I'm a good Baptist kid, I got my Bible class, and they're teaching me what? God didn't write the Bible, it's a fraud. Not shy. The stated agenda. And the best of schools, the best of trade schools, the best of apprenticeships, the best of student work jobs, 
are fraught with a worldview conflict with God's word. We got to prepare them. They will have teachers that ridicule them for their narrow views. They will have bosses that fire them for loving people with the truth. They will have peers that reject them. They will have customers that refuse them. And there are excuses to compromise. Think about the four youth that were dragged off to Babylon. What could they say? Hey, everybody else is eating the king's food. Pat bag's pretty good. They could have said, I'm young. I can't be expected to have the kind of maturity that would require conviction. They could be excused for the change of settings. When in Babylon, you know, it's obviously God's will for me to be here and to fit in. Why would I ruin my witness here by standing out like a sore thumb for something over a pulled pork sandwich? I'm far away from home. No one will know. Oh, th these are just the ceremonial laws. Uh, they're not about morality. I I'm not killing anybody. It's just a BLT. A bell LT. <laughs> Uh, besides, the, the king's command, it's, it's life and death. I mean, I, I can have a really effective, long witness for Yahweh here if I live, but I can't if I die. So, I mean, we've got to be pragmatic. You know, I can really be used by God. I can really have some influence if I just blend in. There's no sense dying uselessly and using the one opportunity I have to make a difference. I mean, what if I just get appreciated by the culture and then they'll listen to me and then, then I can speak for Yahweh? You compromise at the front end, you've compromised the whole thing. Listen, we are reading the book of Daniel because he didn't eat the food, because he still prayed three times a day. We're reading of Azariah, Mishael, and Hananiah because they didn't bow when the music played. There's a lesson here for the importance of godly homes. Um, take a little guess, a little leap at the naming of these kids. Again, maybe their parents weren't godly, but, but maybe they were. Maybe that explains the fortitude these youths had. Where's our safety? Conformity? Lay low, don't rock the boat, don't get noticed. That's not safe. God is your judge. Your safety is in Yahweh. Every time. No matter what happens. Lions, ovens, whatever. How will a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to God's word. So what will happen to these four young men? We'll find out next week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you even for the setup of the challenge, the test, the temptation, the difficulty. We pray that these things would speak to us in the ways that you intend. Lord, let us be faithful. Let us trust in you. If, if we were the last ones standing on the earth, trusting in your word, God, we pray that you would be enough for us. And we ask it for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.